Welcome to The Power of Change, a brand new podcast series produced by Avid Exchange. I'm your host, Michael Prager, the CEO and co-founder of Avid Exchange, and my goal with this podcast is to bring insights from business leaders who embrace the power of change to fuel their careers and transform their businesses and organizations. Each month, we'll bring you a new interview and actionable advice to lead your business through change and power your own professional journey. Our guest in this episode of The Power of Change is Kat Carmichael, the CEO of Strategy 123. Kat has served the community association profession for three decades, both as a management company executive and as a financial services professional, dedicated to serving management companies and their clients. Strategy 123 is a strategic HOA management consulting company focused on creating successful exit strategies, succession plans, and increased profitability. In my conversation with Kat, we cover her journey to becoming a thought leader in the HOA space, the role of technology in the evolution of the industry, and the characteristics that help define a strong leader such as Kat. So season one, episode one, super excited. There's no better way to kick off a new series uh, than having a great guest. And today we have Kat Carmichael, uh, the CEO of Strategy 123. We're probably going to learn a little bit more where the name and the focus of Strategy 123 came from. But maybe, Kat, just to start, uh, maybe give us a little bit of your you know, overview, your role um, and vision uh, that you have for uh, what you're currently doing. Absolutely. Well, there's no question that change is is inevitable, of course, and the community association industry has seen so much of it, but especially the velocity of change in the last couple of years has been really unmatched in anything I've ever seen in my career. So I have a really unique perspective that I'm I'm really thrilled to offer. Um, I did spend the first 15 years of my career right out of the University of California Uh, as a community association manager. So I spent 15 years in that seat. I understood strongly what it is that community association managers do. And then I was very lucky to transition to the business partner side. Um, I started in HOA banking and worked on that side for about 15 years as well. And it was during that tenure that I realized that the industry had to evolve. I mean, I'm talking about when I started in community association management, all the payments came into our office all the checks came out of our office. People use things like check stamps and things like that. Um, And now all that- We know those well. Right, now that that, that stuff is unheard of now. Um, So during my time, not only as a community manager, but also as an HOA banking professional, I had the opportunity to talk to hundreds, if not thousands of community association management executives all across the country. And I think it's kind of because of my management background that they were very welcoming. You know, there's some kind of a fellowship among community managers, and especially if you have a PCAM, that world of of people is very, very small. And there is a professional courtesy courtesy that we share that, hey, from PCAM to PCAM, how can I help you kind of stuff. And so the conversations that I would have with executives often weren't about banking, at least not right off the bat. They were much more about what their challenges and their needs, their needs were. So that's kind of, that's my vision. And that's how I got to to my consulting company by recognizing what the needs of management companies were and how that niche wasn't right. filled by anyone else. Okay, so I, we have to dig in this a little bit more. So, like, what would be some great examples of common issues, tra- uh, challenges that you're seeing routinely across, you know, the HOA landscape? You know, what are, you know, the top couple things that you routinely see? Well, right now, without question, and probably over the last couple of years, it's been a talent shortage. People haven't been able to find people to work in their businesses, um, and they haven't been able to not only attract them, but retain them. So I have a lot of ideas about how to solve that problem without just throwing extra money at the people that you do hire. Some of the ways to to solve that problem um, are industry-related. They're functions of image and reputation and things like that. We have those kinds of things in our control. But it's also that the job isn't known to be super cool. But it actually is cool when you think about what managers do, right? You help people make their homes better, their communities better. You create neighborhoods, you know, Um, but that's not really what people think about. And so we've been spending too much time in kind of the rules enforcement world when we really need to spend a lot more time in the community development world. And there's some really big voices on this topic nationally as well. Um, 
But that's, I think, what needs to change. Because we can't find people, because they don't understand what the job actually is, and because it's not quite cool enough to compete with the um, other employers out there, we need to solve that problem. Okay, so talent number one, and I think, you know, that's probably a shared uh, concern across uh, lots of, you know, lots of different industries, including our industry being, you know, in the software technology area. Um, what would be another one uh, related to, you know, big issue that you get involved with uh, seeing that, you know, uh, you know, as a consultant, you have uh, some really good ways of working with those type of companies to get on a better path? So the second big problem that management company executives say to me all the time is that they get commoditized which means that the buyers, the, the boards of directors, can't really tell the difference between a high-level company and a, and a less qualified company, and so they only know to ask about price. And that's, right. that's fatal, right? I mean, anytime you're judged on price, pressure on price goes downward and you wind up being commoditized, and that's not what community management is at all. Like the very last thing that they should be asking about is what the price is that you charge, they should be asking what the outcome is. So finding talent, avoiding commoditization. And then the third huge, huge, huge pressure is um, profitability. You know, margins in our, in our business are gotcha. huge. We know tech companies' margins are usually north of 50%. Management company yep. margins, if they're kissing 10%, they're doing okay. Well-performing management companies might be making 25%. So they need to figure out a way to increase revenue and decrease expenses, clearly, to make their margins better. Yeah. And we're going to come back to that because uh, I got a hunch that you uh, have a belief that technology can play a role in that equation of how they can, uh, you know, do more with less and be more efficient and drive a greater margin. Absolutely. All right. We're going to come back to that. But before we get to uh, that uh, set of questions, um, okay, so tell us a little bit about your career. Uh, you know, you, um, uh, you grew up in California, went to uh, school in Irvine. Um, I think you were, a, is it criminal justice was your major? Yes, you did a lot of research. All right, so how do we go from a criminal justice major to an HOA, you know, management guru? Uh, just first tell us all, about your career. First of all, I have to give a shout out to the University of California, Irvine Anteaters. Anteaters? Yes. I love it. Thank you. Um, so while I was while I was in college, I was studying criminal justice. At the time, it was the late 80s. They were heavily recruiting women to be in federal law enforcement. They were very much looking for those of us with criminal justice degrees to either join the FBI or the CIA or something like that. They really needed female representation. And I'm really pleased to see, by the way, as a sidebar, there's so many women in law enforcement now. You know, it's obvious that that early outreach was successful. Um, for, for myriad reasons, that wasn't the path I ultimately took, but I wound up as a um, portfolio manager for a contract security firm where we provided officers either for gated communities or for industrial complexes and things like that. And that's how I learned about what an HOA was. It was by providing security services to a gated community in Huntington Beach. And that's really how my whole career got started. Um, the security business is tough. It's a 24-7 deal. And um, I didn't mind that schedule because I had, you know, been a food server through college. So I understood working days and going, you know, working nights, going to school during the days. Right. But it was just too much. It was really difficult to be on call that much. And so um, I was browsing through, you know, the want ads, which we used to do in the 80s before we had easy access to the internet. And I found an ad for a position called Community Association Manager Trainee. And I didn't know what that was, but as I read the job description, I thought, well, I could do that. And I went to the business and I applied. There were 300 applicants for the job at the time. And it came down to the top three people, it was me, a guy, and another person. And they gave us a writing test. And I had to write a violation letter and the scenario was that people were walking on the slopes. I didn't even know what a slope was. I didn't know what a violation letter was, but I knew that I was a good writer. And so I wrote a good enough violation letter that um, ultimately won me the job. Wow. So uh, there you go. The uh, skills from college coming back to, uh, you know, uh, advance your career in a different purpose. Um, I love it. So l let's go back to technology. Um, and so, you know, a little bit about, you know, the landscape of technology and HOA, uh, from being, you know, in this business, um, you know, real estate, 
HOA have been some of the industries that have been laggards of adopting new technology. Um, so maybe just start there is um, why, why has the HOA industry been a laggard in adopting technology and leaning into, you know, making those investments? Well, we, we know that a lot of HOA management company leaders were great community managers. There's a very low barrier to entry to start a management company. And so while if you were really, really good at producing the work, which is being a great community manager, you could start a community management company. That's still the case today. However, that doesn't mean you're going to be profitable. And it doesn't mean you're going to be able to create a competitive advantage that's going to break the commoditization problem that we know, we know that they have. So I think that generally... There's been a lot of courageous leaders in community association management who have trailblazed. They really have created a way to show people that it's okay to take risks. And frankly, that our business lives depend on taking risks. So once someone has proved that a concept works and works well, people follow. So our industry has a lot of great first followers, but not a whole lot of um, original innovators. So I think that's why. I think also they get really bogged down in sort of the day-to-day -day stuff where they just don't have time to innovate. And really, that's what the CEO's job is, right, right Michael? I mean, you know, you've got, to, you've got to be looking through the forest and figuring out what it is that you need to, to do to take your company through it. All right. So speaking, we're going to stay on the theme of innovation um, because one of my, you know, um, all-time favorite, you know, fellow entrepreneurs is a guy named Justin Nelson. Uh, so Justin was a founder of a company called uh, Strong Room, uh, which we acquired back in the 2015 timeframe. I was actually in Houston uh, last Thursday and had dinner with Justin. Uh, he's now um, a great product leader for us and really driving innovation around um, all the integrations and our new integration platform. But um, I think you had an early uh, interaction with Justin. Um, and maybe just tell us about that. So... You're, you're quite right. So dovetailing on what I said earlier, which is that a lot of management companies want great solutions. They just don't want to have to figure it out themselves. And at the time, um, there was a major software platform, still one of the industry leading software platforms that was doing user groups and they would take their show on the road and they would bring along with them business partners who were innovative, who they had done the legwork with, right? So they had figured out how to create banking integrations and how to, how to deal with websites and how to deal with things like payables. And I was sitting in one of those user groups and I looked over to my left and I said, hi, I'm Kat. And he said, hi, I'm Justin. And he started to explain to me what Strong Room Solutions was. And his explanation was, this is a payables lockbox. And I thought, boy, what if we could get rid of paper invoices and make it easier on the management company and create a great audit trail? I thought he was genius, but I thought his messaging was gonna be very, very difficult because he had to disrupt, right? The way it was always right. done. But he had the big brothers of those big software platforms there to help him tell his story and create his value proposition. So yeah, I met Justin really early on. I don't even know how many customers he had at the time, but had I not been in that user group and, and listened to what he was telling me he was gonna change in a management company, I never would have really understood that payables could be, could be pleasurable and not painful. Absolutely. Justin was one of the, you know, early, uh, really visionaries for, you know, uh, especially within HOA and how uh, technology can really be um, a great use case of using technology to automate a key business process. And uh, one of the things that we look at at Avid Exchange is, um, you know, now extending that to other industries is where do we have the characteristic of a very manual, uh, paper intensive process that we around either, you know, managing invoices or getting bills paid uh, that we can deploy our technology and really have a really revolutionizing experience for the customer. And, you know, what we find, you know, every day in our business is when we get in and you have these conversations about why you do it this way, usually the answer is, well, they haven't thought much about it. It's just that they inherited it. Like it's always been done this way. So like, I didn't really think of, you know, is there a better way? And uh, one of the things that uh, maybe is a, uh, you know, uh, array of uh, fresh light is that we're really seeing a trend across not only HOA, real estate, and other key industries that the next generation of leadership, uh, being those that are, you know, I call digital native, um, that grew up, you know, in an online digital environment, they're the ones now that are asking those questions. Uh, when they, you know, show up for work and they've been, uh, you know, a digital native professionals, uh, 
grown into a leadership role, say as a controller, and they get a thousand checks every Tuesday and Thursday, they're like, why am I signing a thousand checks? I don't do this in my personal life. Like, why am I doing it in the business? And uh, meanwhile, you know, no one else has been asking those questions. So, you know, I think one of the learnings, uh, at least that I've had in my career is, you know, uh, how do we advance, uh, you know, the, you know, more leadership where they have the courage to ask the question about like, why do we do it this way? And uh, I'm sure you have some experiences about that in your career as well. Gosh, absolutely. Right. Both from the management side, but also from the business partner side, you know, as a, as a professional banker, part of our job is to make businesses better, right? Bankers really truly should be a good business partner um, in the same vein that the software platforms and the other business partnerships that they have are important components of how to operate the business. And I would ask questions like how many, how many of the payments that you have every single month come from a budget that's knowable? Well, gosh, 50% of them. Right. Once the board adopts the budget, I know what the management fee is. I know what the landscape fee is and all that stuff. I'm like, so why aren't you automating that? Why aren't you creating a way to pay those business partners in an automated, predictable way so that they can experience it and you can experience it? I know your software can post it to the GL. I know they can. You know, so there's no reason to keep doing it over and over. And you're right about that second generation as some of the owner operators that I serve now um, develop their exit strategies they are looking for innovative leaders who are fearless about making changes like that. Right. No, absolutely. So let's go in, you know, you know, the work that you're doing every day uh, and the opportunities you see for technology, obviously around the accounts payable payment areas, one uh, that you've leaned into. What are some of the other areas that you think are the low hanging fruit for HOAs where uh, if they can lean into technology, it makes a difference? Well, uh, outsourcing anything that is predictable. So, Printing and mailing, for example. Um, I find it very inefficient for a management company to deposit money on a postage meter and to maintain their own copier and have to count copies, when in reality, the better thing to do is to send this to one of the very well-qualified HOA mailing houses and let them send everything from a letter to a mass mailing. So mailings is a huge, huge thing um, after payables. Obviously, there's been some tremendous work done in in escrow and resales. There's a lot of great companies who do that. Um, Virtual professionals are another huge, huge advantage for management companies to outsource tasks like customer service and accounting and things like that. And in fact, your platform is one of the most popular things that can be done by a virtual professional because of its SaaS-based system. Right. No, I mean, uh, we saw some, you know, um, you know, great use cases at the beginning of COVID, um, you know, and supporting kind of a workforce that was 100% remote wasn't necessarily ever in, you know, the design plans that we had in terms of, you know, application software. But um, certainly, um, it was a tremendous, tremendous asset to our customers. And oh, my God, listen to some of the stories of what they were doing to support, uh, you know, this process without having an automated system. Uh, We even had, you know, one CFO that uh, bought, you know, vault, uh, little, you know, kind of tabletop, you know, uh, vaults for his AP staff to take home and put on their dining room table to store check stock. And he had armored uh, Brinks cars going to their homes at, you know, between five and seven o'clock every night to pick up the checks that they were printing on their dining room table. Um, you know, that's the extent that you know, people were going to, um, you know, did you hurt yourself when you jumped out of your window? <laughs> after you hurt I'm just story? like, you know, something, uh, uh, I, you know, we have to bring him, uh, you know, that CFO, you know, uh, I think onto a podcast so we can actually record the story. Uh, hopefully he has the courage to be able to uh, actually retell it. Um, but uh, certainly their life was a lot different once they adopted Avid Exchange for sure. Well, in wrapping up, and there's one part that I actually um, um, I wanted to hit on. And, you, you know, you talked about, um, the value of your writing skills. And one of the things that I see across all, you know, developing leaders and, and female leaders as well is, uh, a core skill set of communication and to be able to not only, um, uh, you know, communicate with peers around, you know, kind of tasks at hand, but also be able to communicate like a vision, a vision for yourself, a vision for, you know, the company you're working with. Um, and, um, you know, Maybe share a little bit about, you know, kind of that, um, you know, journey for yourself. Uh, Certainly, you know, writing has been a great tool of how you've communicated, but maybe share a little bit more about that. 
So you're right. I mean, you are what you say and you are what you write. And um, my mother was a journalism major in college as well as a Marine Corps officer. So there's no reason for me to take shortcuts on anything that I've, that I've written. But it has turned out to be a tremendously valuable skill set for me, um, not only to communicate things like vision, but also to communicate properly processes and value propositions, those types of things. So I think that's really cool that you brought that up because not many people talk about communication skills, and yet they're among the most vital things that any leader can have. Yeah. And one of the things I try often to tell my clients is, you are the leader of your own ship, and these things, change requires leadership, and you have to prove that you have the ability to lead through these kinds of changes. And part of it is to not only create the right vision that everyone will charge up the hill behind you to do, but also um, let them know what's in it for them. That's the key. When you write something, it's not about you. It's always about them. So from a marketing standpoint, any of those kinds of things has to show and resonate immediately with the person who reads your writings. Well, I think that's a great way to wrap this segment. Um, where you take is um, a skill that you learned, you know, early in your career around the writing, uh, you know, how you got one in your first initial roles, um, and then, you know, how that continues to be applied towards progressing your growth as a leader um, and creating, you know, that vision that others will follow. And communication is a cornerstone to that. So uh, real life, you know, uh, examples on something that you've done and it's a phenomenal story. And uh, Kat, I th can't thank you enough for being here today, uh, participating in season one, episode one of The Power of Change. Thanks so much. And thanks for all the good that you've done for, for our industry as well. Thank you. Well, we're in this together and uh, look forward to many more, uh, you know, industry conferences and podcasts and everything else where we keep evangelizing, you know, the opportunity that the HOA industry has, especially in the adoption of technology. Boy, it was awesome spending some time with Kat Carmichael, uh, Strategy 123. And a couple of things that I thought were really interesting about hearing Kat's story and building her business um, was really kind of three themes that I find that are kind of characteristic of success um, of lots of companies, including Avid Exchange, actually. Um, and the first one is that, you know, she's extremely passionate in what she does. Um, it's contagious. I got excited listening to her. And, uh, and passion, uh, especially by the leader, is something that's just you know, really important. Uh, and it really serves as a cornerstone in kind of building the culture of a business. Uh, the second one was, um, you know, Kat's really curious and it really shows up in the innovation that she's incorporated into her business. Um, she's always asking, you know, um, why not? And, uh, and always innovating. And uh, I think, you know, there's a lot of kind of corollary comparison and comparisons that you can make, uh, including Steve Jobs. You know, he I had a cornerstone of, uh, you know, him talking about innovation. And, uh, and he said, you know, innovation really distinguishes between a leader and a follower. And I think that's been uh, certainly true for Kat as strategy one, two, three. And then um, the last one is really about dreaming big. And um, we have a saying at Avid Exchange about fortune favors the bold, that we need to continue to making big bets and investments in our business. And I think Kat had the same, you know, dream in terms of thinking uh, big and making kind of bold decisions in growing her business. Uh, so it was um, really, you know, I enjoyed my time spending with uh, Kat and learning her story. And it was an awesome experience. That will do it for this episode of The Power of Change. This episode was produced by one of my teammates, Travis Durkee. If you like what you've heard, make sure to subscribe to the channel and leave a five-star review. Keep an eye out for new episodes each month with leaders from various industries. In the meantime, make sure to follow me and Avid Exchange on Instagram and LinkedIn. Links to each are in the show notes and visit Avid Exchange for our latest research reports and business insights. So until then, remember the best future is ahead of us. Make it a great one.